Hey, welcome everybody. To those of you watching on LinkedIn or Facebook or on another channel, thank you for joining us. I It's my pleasure and um, honor to have Ron Baker here with us, who um, was kind enough to do this broadcast with us. And I'm looking forward to a great conversation with Ron about subscription pricing, recurring revenue, subscription models, and everything in between. Uh, Ron, welcome to uh, this conversation. No, oh, thanks, Michael. This will be fun. Looking forward to it. Yeah, and Ron, just for for the audience of those who may um, may or may not be familiar with who you are and kind of what your specialty or focus is, why don't you just give a little bit of introduction about yourself? No, oh, geez, nothing bores me more than talking about my bio. But uh, I'm a recovering CPA, founder of the Verisage Institute, and I've been kind of preaching value pricing essentially since I started doing it in my firm in 1989. Wow. And I've uh, been teaching it since 1994 publicly to the rest of the profession and published my first book about it in 98. So really trying to kill the billable hour and the timesheet. And now I'm happy to say there's uh, something that's come along that is a completely new and different business model that even blows up value pricing. That's 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 crazy. Yeah. Then, well, yeah. Thank you. And thank you for all the contribution you've made to the profession and, and especially in this conversation of value pricing over the number of years i could have i'll age myself but i could have been watching you since i was eight so i didn't i didn't know that but that's awesome <laughs> that's great to know um, that makes me feel old michael that's okay. <laughs> yeah no but it just means you're a wise sage which is awesome uh so uh, yeah you've been known ron as a, a value pricing thought leader in the accounting space and in, in many other spaces. Um, you've written about it. You uh, you've coined terms in it. You've challenged people in it. Why the move into subscription pricing and 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 subscription based pricing evangelism? Like why why that sudden move and how did that come about for you? It came about just by you know looking out the window and looking at economic reality. I mean, there is a subscription tsunami. Um, flooding the world and to to ignore it, you're just kind of sticking your head in the sand. Uh, you know, Teen Zo, uh, the uh, founder of Zora, which is the, um, you, know, you know, Michael, they're the yep. uh, one of the software companies that helps businesses run subscription. And he wrote a book called Subscribed. And in that book, he says, you know, in five years, you won't buy anything. You'll subscribe to everything. Now, I'm not willing to go that far. He's got a vested interest in, you know, really pushing this model. And I understand that, but I will say this in five years time, you'll have the option to subscribe to almost everything. And your business has to deal with that. Even if you do nothing, even if you ignore this, you're going to be confronted because competition is going to be out there that offers this and to ignore it is really to miss I think uh, a, a literal renaissance going on in the world. I mean, I, whether you call, want to call it a renaissance or a gold rush, it is exactly that. And it's, it's unstoppable, I think. And it's a, an incredibly uh, bright way or, or sophisticated way to run, especially a professional service firm. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, there's no doubt about it. You can't, you can't run away or avoid the fact that consumer purchasing behavior, business purchasing behavior is being heavily influenced by, if, if not trained or, you know, trained in the idea of subscription on demand services um, on, on a subscription based model. And, and so it's going to be hard to avoid in the future in, in almost all industries, or at least industries that matter to most of us in our daily lives. So, so that's amazing. So what, you know, which types of industries and businesses do you see do you see as first movers I mean, outside of obviously software, software SaaS companies have been in the space for a long time um, for, you know, for quite a while now. Um, but now we're seeing all types of industries. What are you, what are you seeing as the types of industries or businesses as first movers in this? We're trying to keep track of this and <laughs> it's just, it's like drinking from a fire hose. I mean, every, <laughs> every week we get sent, you know, five or 10 new things. I mean, socks, underwear, firewood, <laughs> razors, uh, all, all sorts of things we can subscribe to. But the bottom line is a lot of people, you know, want to move away from the albatross of ownership. Mm -hmm. You know, ownership's a pain. You got to maintain the thing. You got to store it. You got to recycle it. You got to discard it. You got, you know, you got to fix it when it's broke and, and a lot of shoe leather involved. If I subscribe to something and it breaks, oh, they just come out and replace it. And, and so we're seeing it all over. I mean, 
you can get it. You can, you can subscribe to homes now and live in 22, 50 different places. I think it's Rome and there's a couple of others that offer, you know, living arrangements on a subscription basis. You can subscribe to cars. I can subscribe to a Porsche through the Porsche drive program. I can subscribe to a boat from Brunswick. I can subscribe to, you know, home repairs. I can res- uh, pr- uh, subscribe to all sorts of things. And it, it's really just, it's all about access and convenience and, and making um, your life frictionless. There's something, a, there's a direct relationship when we subscribe to a company. It's not the same thing as a transaction. It's a direct relationship and there's something psychological And one of the problems with this whole conversation, Michael, is we don't have a good vocabulary to explain this. We don't. Our vocabulary is groping for the right words (laughs) to explain the connection that a subscription-based business has. Did you ever think anybody, anybody would be passionate about a razor blade? (laughs) And yet when you hear people talk about Harry's or Dollar Shave Club, they sound like lunatics to me. (laughs) <laughs> but they're passionate and and I kind of get it because they're they have a direct relationship with that company when you subscribe. Yeah, I think that I think you're right. I, I think there's there we're groping for language to describe this. You know, there's language that comes from religion to describe it, <laughs> cults almost, tribes. Yeah. Um, we're also you know, the the terms memberships don't sound powerful enough. Um, you know, there's loyalty involved. We're building we're building loyalty into brands, but it seems it seems stronger than that, almost, almost like you, like you were t- referring to, almost cult-like or, or avid follower-like. Um, we're trying to grope for what, what um, are you? Which industries are you seeing that need to move to this, or should really be considering this? But they're just needing to be pushed. You know, they they really need to be pushed because they're just not understanding the opportunities um, that are out there regarding this business model. Well, one of them, uh, and it was actually an early adopter, is medicine. Huh. <clears throat> now we have uh, these things called you know, there's concierge doctors, which tend to go after the middle class, the upper middle class, and some even go after just CEOs, you know, really, really busy people. Uh, and their prices can, you know, be anywhere from a, a cable bill a month to <laughs> 30 grand a year to cover a family of four if you're the CEO. Um, and then there's their direct cousin, which is the direct primary care practices. We have about 1,200 of these now throughout the United States, and these are subscription-based general physicians. And since a GP can handle 60 to 80% of your medical needs, uh, you have a direct relationship. They, they were doing telemedicine long before COVID, long, long before COVID. You had email access to them. You had same-day appointments. Some of them will come to your house, your office, wherever you are. They'll travel to you because they serve less patients. Your typical GP in the U.S. has something like 2,400 to 3,000 panel patients. A concierge doctor might have one or 200. A a DPC doctor might have five or 600. So, yes, they have fewer patients, but that means they always have capacity to handle anything that comes up. And what they and and what they can provide under their roof is continuously expanding. Some dispense drugs, some have MRI machines, other diagnostic tools, some do other types of consulting, some offer massage, chiropractic, whatever. These things are flourishing, and they are um, they are the perfect model for subscription based businesses. And I find so many parallels between the accounting profession and the medical profession. The doctor's there to keep us healthy. What's the CPA there for? To keep us financially healthy. So uh, that's kind of my model. And Michael, the first concierge medicine, medical practice in the United States was started by a guy named Howard Marin. He was the Seattle Sonics, Supersonics, I guess, a team doctor huh. for the basketball league. And when one of his players got hurt, he'd go out there on the court. He knew exactly what to do. And he said to himself, I know exactly what to do with these people because, of course, I know everything about these players. Why don't I do that in my practice? Why can't I do that in my medical practice? Because I get to spend a total of five minutes with them, right? So he started MD Squared, which was the first concierge medical practice in the United States, I think in the world, in 1996. Wow. We are actually behind (laughs) the curve. 
Yeah, it's 25, 25 years ago. I can't, I, I, I can't amazing, imagine that. That's amazing. Yeah, that's a lot. And, and what, what do you think was the insight that happened in the medical space or there that, that the same insight kind of would have to happen in the accounting field or other fields in order to push the industry? What's that insight? What's that tipping, you know, that tipping point or that knowledge of wisdom that came up that said, to a doctor, I can do this when no one else in around me is doing that. It's a great question, and I think uh, this this is this is where the differences between medicine and becoming a CPA or being a CPA are different. Um, the the great motivation for DPC and concierge in the medicine medical world was the fee for service and the insurance model. Doctors hate it. Yeah. Um, it's a pain in the butt. They're paid for each service, you know, it's, it's like almost being paid by the hour. They're on that treadmill. They have to have a huge bureaucracy to fill out insurance forms, whether it's the Medicaid for Medicare for government or whether it's private insurance, it, it, the, those third parties are, are intimately involved in what they'll cover, what they won't. So they get involved in, you know, how that doctor's providing medicine. And the doctor said enough, this is not why I became a doctor. I became a doctor to help people, not to serve a bureaucracy, not to serve an insurance company, but to help people. They didn't even like the electronic health records. It, you, uh, pretty hard to find a, a DPC doctor that that uses electronic health records. They hate them yeah. because it, it, it turns them into better typists than doctors. So that was the motivation. It was frustration with the fee for service. And, but in my mind, the parallel is if you're out there selling hours, or you're out there even on a fixed price basis with your customers or on a value price basis, it, you probably still have too many customers. Mm -hmm. You're probably still not going as deep with them to keep them healthy financially as you could. And therefore, if you shrunk your panel of customers, you'd be able to do more for each one, charge each one three to five times more. I mean, this isn't free, um, but you, you'd have less customers. You'd make more money. And you'd have a better quality of life, and you'd have happier customers. Right, that that makes a lot of sense. And so, yeah, for any profession, kind of like in the medical field, there's going to be a number of customers out there. There's probably thousands, if not tens of thousands, of them, or millions of them, looking for that deeper relationship with their professional, whether it's an accounting professional, a lawyer, a marketing specialist, a sales specialist, whatever it is uh, you provide, uh, where you're going to have to actually serve them more deeper and create a real relationship uh, that, that, that ties you together, just like you would, as you described with a primary care physician uh, or a doctor um, for people who are new to this model. Um, but they're, you know, what are interested in, in making that shift, right? They have a current business. Maybe they're charging by the hour. They're selling products one at a time in a store. Um, what what are some what are some first steps you're seeing actually get people to make that shift happen? Is it close the business down and restart? Uh, <laughs> is, is it a wholesale? Hey, going forward, never sell you know all all new customers. Get them on a subscription and grandfather the old customers into you know into it. And if they fall off, you know what is that step that you would recommend? And is it is it, is there one one solution or is it different for everybody? I think it's different for everybody. I wish I I had the one solution. I do see advantages to starting a new entity that can do this from the ground up and not have any of that legacy system and legacy baggage of whether it's billable hours or even value pricing comes with its own bureaucracy and measurements. I mean, this is a different business model. So it requires a different philosophy with respect to your pricing and it requires a different dashboard with respect to what you're measuring. Mm -hmm. As you know, Michael, better than anybody, uh, the, the subscription income statement looks completely different because it rolls yeah. forward that annual recurring revenue and it and it and it core it, it categorizes things so you can track things like cost of acquiring a customer and figure out lifetime value and all of those metrics there's no room in there for timesheet data there's no room <laughs> in there for realization and utilization and effective hourly rate and all the other bs measurements that come with hourly billing um, it's just a completely different model. What you look at, what you measure, what you pay attention to is, is even different than in value pricing. And, you know, this, and we can talk about this later and maybe another one of the questions, but 
you know, one of the things that we hear a lot from practitioners, well, can I have a hybrid? Can I keep, can I keep my hourly or my value pricing practice? And then can I add a subscription on top of it? And look, we've on my radio show, the soul of enterprise, we've interviewed four of the worldwide best selling authors on this mm -hmm. business model, teen Zoe and Janzer, Robbie Kelman Baxter and John Warlow. And we've asked him this question and John Warlow especially said, I tried to do this in my business. He's a serial entrepreneur. And he said, I tried to do this in my business. I tried to have my cake and eat it too. And he says, I've come to the conclusion that no, this business model doesn't mix well with others. So, uh, but I, <laughs> I would think the, the first thing that folks have to understand, even before they start thinking about what the transition is, is to understand the outcome that your customers are really buying. Customers don't buy products and services. They don't buy tax returns. They don't buy audits. They buy some type of outcome. And this is another thing why I think professionals like doctors and lawyers and CPAs and marketing agencies and IT consultants are so well poised to adopt this model. We're paid for outcomes as professionals. We're there to usher them to an outcome, not to sell them a bunch of tasks. And the, the subscription model forces you to fo focus on that outcome. I'll give you an example. Think about the eye business. You know, the, it's just the, you know, if you wear glasses, you don't wear glasses, it looks like, but you know, if you wear glasses, what are you really buying? You know that if you're going to go get an eye exam, you're probably going to get a new prescription. You're probably going to have to go somewhere else, whether it's online or down to, you know, uh, eyeglasses in an hour or whatever, you're going to get your prescription filled. It's, it, it may take a few days, whatever. And people, well, people say, well, look, you're buying the doctor's time. You're buying, you're paying for the eye. No, you're not. You're buying perfect vision right? right as the right. customer. You want to see it, again. <laughs> you want to see again. You want to see well enough to you know, pass your DMV test or whatever. <laughs> and here's the thing. This Nordic Eye Company known as Sinsam, they're in, they're in the Nordic countries. They wanted to remake this industry. And they said, why can't you subscribe to eyeglasses? And all the staid people that have, all the experts have said, oh, well, this will never work. There's no way. Nobody's going to pay to subscribe for eyeglasses. And so they started this company called SimSam in 2016. At the end of 2019, they have 200,000 subscribers. Wow. You get an annual eye exam and your glasses are free. Wow. You get a new prescription, they update all your glasses, your sunglasses, your reading glasses, your whatever, how many ever glasses you need, they'll update them all. And they have 200,000 subscribers and everybody said it wouldn't work. So when people ask us questions and we say things like, well, we're not sure of that, you're going to have to experiment with that, you're going to have to trial and error it. There's a lot of groping here in the darkness because it's a new business model. That freaks people out because they want you to have answers for every little contingency and every little, no, you're going to iterate, but you're also going to have a phenomenally more valuable business under an annual recurring model than you are with certainly hourly billing and even uh, under value pricing. Right. And, and I mean, and the power of saying I have 200,000 customers buying from me every month versus I have to go and sell one time, 200,000 times, new 200,000 new Thousand. customers that I know if, I don't know if they'll ever come back, right? right. That the power of that is just so wildly I, I, different. I, I get to start at zero every day <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> under, under a transactional. And, and that includes, by the way, a value pricing model. Value right. pricing is still transactional. You're still you know selling scope of work and blah, blah, blah. And you're also creating a lot of friction. Oh, you had a scope change. Oh, well, we have to call the Department of Paperwork and have you sign this change request in triplicate. And I kind of blame myself for foisting that onto the profession. <laughs> With subscription, basically, if something changes, you're covered. Yeah. You're yeah, covered. That, yeah, just yeah, like the doctor, the you break your leg, you you need stitches, whatever you need that we're capable of doing, you're covered. Now you could still have tears, you know. You could still tear things out where maybe if they needed a, a particular service, they'd have to upgrade for a while, get that service, and then maybe they could slide back or whatever. But the bottom line is, it's no longer scope out of scope. It's what's covered and what's not covered because it's more like insurance. It's convenience it's frictionless, it's, it's access when they want, uh, you know, when and where they want it. 
Um, and that's why I think it makes so much sense. Do you, do you think there are industries that um, can't go into this model or, or are going to have a hard time <laughs> going to this model? Yeah, this is a great question. We, we've <laughs> actually asked all these authors about this as well. And we think of Ed and I, Ed Kless, my co-host from Sage on the solo enterprise, we talk about this all the time offline. Um, you know, think about funeral parlors. Do you mm. subscribe to a funeral parlor? Interesting. Would you? <laughs> why would you subscribe to a realtor? Why yeah. would you subscribe to a divorce attorney? You know, right. unless you're Liz Taylor or, or you know J Lo. <laughs> uh, why would you subscribe to a custom home builder? Even though we've seen architects that design custom homes offer subscription quite successfully to custom home builders. You know, right? If I'm a custom home builder. Why not have an architect on subscription, right? That I can access. Uh, so there probably are pharmaceuticals would be another one. Um, could we, could we, would we subscribe to pharmaceuticals? And I, and I think there's ways to do it. And when we knee jerk reaction this and we say, oh, there's no way to do this. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think we're thinking creatively enough. Did I lose Michael? Oh boy. Andrea? Oh, there he's coming back. Did I lose Michael or did we lose Michael? Uh, you're on mute, I think. I think you're on mute, Andrea. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. There you go. We did temporarily lose Michael, but he is okay. coming back ASAP. Um. Okay, no worries. <laughs> I, I, I see a question here from Adam. Uh, I see mental health is right for this kind of disruption. Yes, Adam, uh, I do believe uh, mental health would be a phenomenal thing to put on subscription. In fact, in the medical space, we're seeing more and more specialists also open up concierge uh, type practices, including, by the way, dentists. There's many dentists now that offer this. And if you think about it, they're perfect for this too. I mean, why can't you just pay your dentist, uh, you know, whatever it is per year and they'll cover anything you need, you know, and with no limits, no, no, nothing, just whatever they're capable of doing, they'll cover it. And it just makes so much sense. Mm. So mental health, there is better help in that space. And I think that they were trying to do subscription, but I recently found out that they're still kind of doing a per session model. I know that you pay $300 per month, but it's still kind of contingent on um, mm -hmm. on the number of sessions. How have you seen people try to kind of get into the space and ride that line mm -hmm. unsuccessfully? And what would you say to them? <laughs> yeah, to this, okay, nothing frustrates me more than that. Yeah. And I, I see Hector's in, out there in the audience. Hello, Hector. <laughs> um, and he's heard me rant on this, but I'm going to give you a phenomenal, my favorite all-time example of a subscription business, and it's Porsche. It's called Porsche Drive used to be called Porsche Passport. It's now in something like nine or 10 cities. They've really expanded this thing. You can subscribe to a Porsche. There's three options. You can have a single, you can pick a single car, single model, or you can have a multi-plan, uh, multi-models where you can just swap out. So like I'm in the wine country and if I have a convertible and I call up Porsche and say, hey, I've got you know friends coming out this weekend where we wanna go wine tasting, send out an SUV. They white glove out an SUV, white wow. glove away the, the, uh, you know, the convertible. I can do this as many times. There's no limitation on it. They pay for everything except gas and tolls, everything, insurance, taxes, everything's covered. If I need maintenance, if I need tires, whatever, they just white glove it out and drop one off. What is, so uh, I'm looking at this going, this is phenomenal. You know, it's like $3,200 a month to subscribe to uh, a Porsche 911. Uh, it's a little bit more if you want to be involved in their multi model where you can swipe swap out and get different SUVs and different models. So I'm watching this and we're watching this thing like a hawk because we're really excited. They first started in Atlanta and in Toronto and then it, ex it started to expand and now it's all over the Bay Area and Monterey, San Francisco, down in LA, San Diego, all over. And it's, it's going to expand more. And they, at first, there's no mileage restrictions. Uh, and and people say, well, what what's 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 different about 
Porsche th- Porsche drive and, and say buying a Porsche or leasing a Porsche <laughs> because, and this is key, you're not buying a car. Oh, right. You're subscribing to Porsche. It's a direct relationship with Porsche. It even, in a way, kind of goes around their dealers, which mm. this is why dealers hate <laughs> these things, by the way. Um, and that's a direct relationship. And now, and I just got a new update from Porsche Drive. They put a mileage restriction on it, 2,000 miles. And now they just dropped it to 1,500 a month. Now, you know, most people do not drive over 18,000 miles a year, and I get that. But you know what this is, Michael? This is the bean counters getting involved with this and going, oh, well, we can't have this. So what do they do? They they put a mileage restriction on it, buck a mile if you go over. And you know what that turns it into in the mind of the consumer? A lease. Yeah, right. And so they're framing it like a lease. And it's not supposed to be framed like a lease or buying. It's supposed to be different because it's convenient. And they white glove me out new model. Stop it. The bean counters get involved in these things and they wreck them. <laughs> yeah, and 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 why they didn't just begin introducing higher prices, right? Or increasing exactly. and just just increase the price. And, and let me but let me customers. ask you, right? Let me ask you a better question because I know you're a marketing guy. Yeah. If I'm a Porsche subscriber and I want to drive thirty thousand miles a year, which you know is kind of getting in truck driver territory. Right. Why would they want to stop me being out on the road, being an ambassador for their brand? Exactly. Crying out loud. (laughs) What is wrong with these people? This has to be the bean counters doing this. Oh, yeah. It can't be the car guys because car guys understand that you want to drive a a 911 around the country a few times. Well, and and, 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 yeah, and then that's why we talked about earlier how accountants accountants have a very hard time and challenge understanding this, right? We. The, the you 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 since since the late eighties have been talking about value pricing moving from hourly to value that was a hard enough conversation you've been doing that for for a while now now we're shifting the subscription pricing and it, and and instead of thinking of there's more there's there's even higher prices we can charge because this thing is 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 producing highly loyal highly loyal customers um, that are connect you know that are that are loyal to Porsche that have a direct relationship. Um, instead you, you, you're saying to the relationship, well, I don't know if I want you for over for dinner that much, right? I don't know if right, I want to right. be with you. I don't you're, you're, with you. <laughs> you're still putting that scope around. Well, if you go, but if you go outside the bounds a little bit, we're going to charge you a buck a mile. But that defeats the whole purpose of convenience, frictionless, not having to deal with the department of paperwork and worrying about whether or not I go over. This is what we mean when we talk about value pricing, we talked about, you have to, about, you have to price the customer. You can't price the services because value subjective customers have different valuations of different services. So price the customer. Well, in uh, subscription, you're actually pricing the relationships mm. and the portfolio. And that means what I mean by the portfolio is you got to look at it like an investment banker or a venture capitalist where, or, you know, there's an old joke about uh, when, when Sony bought um, one of the movie companies, I forget which one, one of the movie studios, they had their first meeting and, and one of the uh, execs stood up from the studio and he said, look, we're going to make 10 movies this year and five of them are going to flop. They're going to, we're going to lose money. Two of them are going to, you know, bust even, we might make a little bit of profit. Three of them would blockbusters one of the japanese executives raised his hand he said well why don't we just make the three blockbusters because it's a portfolio so you're going to have some people in that porsche uh subscription that that drive five thousand miles a year and then you're going to have other bozos that drive forty thousand miles but it's going to even out across the portfolio right if there's if they're crazy enough to subscribe to a porsche they're fanatics about your brand why wouldn't you want them out there but it's funny. It's funny. Jim, Jim, Jim's have figured this out right for a long time. Gym memberships, where they know that out of the hundred percent of Jim's members, twenty percent of them use the gym. Use 80, use the gym eighty percent of the time. Eighty percent right. of them use it twenty percent of the time. And yep. you don't see them sending messages to those twenty percent saying, "Well, if you use too many weights in our gym, <laughs> we're going to start charging you a dollar." Or if if you're in the racquetball court just a little too long. You're gonna and again an extra surcharge. 
Um, so there, there are other industries have clearly figured this out and made it very convenient. And, and what do they get? They get loyal customers that pay. And then they get a lot of customers that pay without even using the service quite often. But when they sure. want to use the service, it's available to them they know it's right there. there, right? And so, you know, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm part of a CrossFit gym, a CrossFit box nearby. And some months I'm there three days, three days a week, four days a week. And some months I'm just so busy. I, 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 I'm there once or twice that month, but I don't want to have to resubscribe or renegotiate a deal or an offer with that box. Uh, I want to be able to go and, and join that community whenever it's convenient for me. Um, and, and no, and they know then they have a loyal customer that's paying regardless of how often or little that I use it. Um, In fact, that's one of the, uh, that's one of the great things that these concierge and DPC doctors have learned, you know, we're trained just as people, uh, to only go to the doctor when we're sick. And these concierge doctors have to retrain us, reeducate us to come when you're feeling well, because they want (laughs) to keep you that way. And that they say, that's a big hassle. A lot of people don't come. And yet they still pay and they're thrilled. It, you know, insurance is a, is a kind of a wacky product. It's the only thing that we pay for that we're thrilled when we don't use it. You know, <laughs> I'm thrilled. I didn't file an earthquake claim. I'm thrilled. <laughs> I didn't file a life insurance claim, but we still pay for it because we like that peace of mind and we like to know it's there if we need it. And it's the same thing with concierge doctors. And it could be the same way with CPAs. We underinvest in convenience, frictionless, and peace of mind. And I mean, mm. significantly under invest in it. And that means we underprice it. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I agree with you. And what would you say are the biggest barriers that you've heard for business owners and people to enter into this, this model? You know, what, what seems to be the hurdle to say, I, I, I just can't, I don't see it, Ron. I can't do it. It'll, it'll destroy <laughs> everything that I'm about, you know? Right. What, what, what are you seeing in those verses? Is it fear? Is it, uh, is it, I, you know, what, what is that? Yeah, I, it's a lot of things. It's, <laughs> it's mindset. It is fear. Um, you know, and I, and boy, my response to fear, especially in business, especially for a business owner, if you're not a risk taker, you have no business being in business, you know, <laughs> go back and be an employee, uh, because business is all about risk. Um, it's all about, you know, acting in the darkness of time. You have to have faith to be an entrepreneur. You have to, because faith precedes knowledge. Faith precedes action. Faith precedes meaning and purpose Mm -hmm. in your life. I mean, we have, we walk by faith, not by sight. And if you're not willing to take risks, uh, geez, you'll just, you'll just kind of flounder around. I mean, all profits are derived from risk. Mm -hmm. So, it, maybe people are more risk uh, prone than I than I give them credit for, but we hear a lot of fear. We hear the uh, the cost accounting. I call it the cost accounting mindset of, well, how do I know if I'm making money on each customer, each job, each hour? You know that whole we have to measure each hour, each ten minute increment to make sure that we're profitable and we have good realization. How would I know which employees are good and which ones aren't? How would I know which customers are good and which ones aren't if if I don't keep track of this on a per unit basis? And they just can't get over that 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 mindset that we're all taught as CPAs. But we have to have a portfolio mindset. You know, we have to be like the Sony studio that says, hey you know, we're going to make five duds, but we're going to have three blockbusters. And I'm not saying that I I think your price is going to be able to go up enough where you're going to be profitable on everything. Mm -hmm. But the fact is some customers in some years are going to use you more than others. That's just a fact of any portfolio in any business. And we can price for that. And you can, you can build that to your advantage and still leverage that peace of mind, that convenience and that frictionless. So it's really the mindset and getting over the cost accounting mentality, getting over the fear of really changing to a different business model because it does change everything. Um, I think, uh, and, and look, I praise Porsche because they're, they're, they have stuck and expanded. One thing I, I forgot to mention, Michael, and this is, this is a, this is a time bomb. I'll just drop about this Porsche drive program. 80% of the people who have signed up for Porsche drive are new to the brand. Amazing. Now what's amazing about that is Porsche customers are dying. (laughs) That's a fact of demographics, right? The you know, they're, they're dying off. And so Porsche has been, you know, trying everything to go after a younger demographic, including women. 
uh, just like Harley Davidson's got the same problem. And uh, this Porsche Drive program is filling that gap. It's bringing in tons of new people. That, and my question is, what are these people going to drive for the rest of their lives? Right, right. It's going to be a Porsche. And how much do car companies spend? You know, people see these slick ads on car companies or magazines for car company, BMW, Porsche, whatever, Audi. And they don't realize that they're not to get new customers. They're to reinforce uh, to current customers, hey, you made a great decision. And so they spend a lot of money on that. And now here's a way to just lock somebody in. You subscribe to Porsche for one year. There's a 90% chance they got you for life. Right, right. I I, I totally agree. And there's probably a, a mindset shift around, hey, you could shift a lot of that spend and take a look at, you know, all the bean counters out there worrying about every single dollar made and whether or not you're making customers. Think about all that money it's spent on the sales and marketing side to try to get a repeat buyer to come back. Um and to take into account of that versus having that locked in customer as a, as a member, you met, you mentioned, you know, uh, you mentioned, I think all the barriers, the barriers and, and, and the fear people have, it seems like there's certain industries that have figured out pricing, um, around the subscription. So for example, um, Costco, right They they basically make mm. very little money selling products. All their money's made on the subscription of the membership to Costco. Um, and, and, Everyone who's a member of Costco that I know say it's worth every dollar to be a member of Costco yeah. uh, because of because of what they sell and the experience and they probably sell more hot dogs than anybody that I know. <laughs> <laughs> right, and they could, yeah, and they could probably <laughs> triple their subscription price. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And so, um, do you think that in every industry that it ends up like that? That there's some kind of price where you're there's some kind of service or product you're really making the money on. And then the rest of it really is a break-even proposition, um, or even a money-losing proposition. What um, or are there models where it doesn't have to end up like Amazon Prime and Amazon or Costco memberships and Costco that um, that they're actually standalone pricing on that? And you you gave one por- Porsche um, in regards to that, but are there are there other examples? I, I would think there seems to be a price they found that said we have enough subscribers at at this price. We can sell products all day long and lose money or make money. doesn't matter. We have this consistent member that's coming back in all the time and it's loyal to us. Does that make right. sense? Yeah, yeah, no, it does. This this kind of gets to that two business model because if you look at Costco, if you look at Amazon Prime, which is another incredibly successful subscription program and one of the early ones, um, those are hybrid models because mm-hmm. those people or companies are obviously still selling tangible things. Right. So you pay to get you, you're, it's basically a two part tariff. If you want to get technical <laughs> about it there, you're like a country club, you're paying for the privilege of being able to play there, buy more, whatever. And, um, you know, one of the things that Ed and I talk a lot about because we're both Apple fanatics is Apple's got this hybrid model too. Mm-hmm. Now Apple makes about half its revenue from subscriptions, Apple news, Apple music, blah, 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 blah. And they're constantly tweaking those packages or whatever. But Michael, why can't I subscribe to Apple hmm. and just say, hey, Apple, I want a new laptop. I want to, I need a new iPhone. I, I'd like to upgrade to your new iPad. Why can't I do that? Now, that freaks people out. I'm sure it would freak <laughs> Apple shareholders out like it freaked Adobe uh, shareholders out. But you know what? I think that's where Apple's going to go. Now, I happen to think Apple's smart enough to figure it out, hopefully, because they're pretty sophisticated pricers. But I have a direct relationship with Apple. If I subscribe to them, oh my God, I, I, I would just be totally locked in. Oh yeah, like, and, and they could figure it out. Now and, they haven't. And you'd spend more money. You'd spend more I, money with. Them. I, I would yeah. spend more money, and I've spent a lot of money with Apple over my <laughs> life because it's the only product I've ever used my whole professional life since 1984. Um, but yeah, they they could make it a lot easier. They could make it a lot with a lot less friction. I wouldn't have to go to. You know the Apple Store and get the new product. Yeah, you know, just say hey, you know, just ship it to me. Um, anyway, I just I I just find that an interesting question. It kind of goes back to your question: which industries are not set up for this? And we talked about pharmaceutical companies. Why wouldn't I be able to subscribe to Moderna? Mm. I su- if I'm a subscriber to Moderna, maybe I get the first uh, vaccines that come out for any new ep- you know pandemic that comes down the line. I just. We haven't thought creatively enough about this. Part of it's limit limitation of our our creativity and our vocabulary, but part of it too is that fear that you talked about as well, and just our our 
you know, we need faith to be able to go into this. Do you, you talked about, um, you know, if you decide to go into this, what you need to measure, it's going to be very different, right? You can't, right. you can't just go to a typical income statement in QuickBooks and start, and start <laughs> measuring the performance of your subscription model business. Uh, what are some of those KPIs, those important metrics that you're guiding, uh, you know, business owners and and business leaders to start looking at if they're going to start down this journey? What are, what's the focus there? Yeah, and there's and you're I know intimately familiar with all of these, and there's been a lot written on this. I think uh, uh, Andressen Horowitz, the venture capital firm mm -hmm. in uh, Northern California, has issued a report. Uh, in fact, I think there's two reports on um, mature and, and startup subscription businesses and how they analyze and value a subscription business. What are the metrics that they look at? But it's things like monthly recurring revenue, which, of course, becomes annual recurring revenue. It's things like annual contract value, customer acquisition costs. You want to obviously measure churn rate which is the amount of revenue that you're losing, not just the number of customers. You want to measure things like recency and frequency and volume, you know, kind of share a wallet type metrics and how much time they spend with you. Mm -hmm. um, there's a great author. He wrote The Experience Economy. His name is Joseph Pine. And he says that not only should we not track, you know, like billable hours inside of firms, he said what we should really be tracking is the timesheet of the customer, either by saving their time or if you're Disney, you want them to spend more time. You want more billable hours from the customer. They You want them in your park for a week, not just a day or two. And he thinks we should be measuring that. And I think that's a really good point. Um, there's also things like lifetime value, and there's metrics around that to determine where you stand as a subscription business. But, you know, off air before we went live, we were talking about pilot and pilot. Yeah is valued at what 1.2 1. 1.1 yeah. 1, 2 billion dollars. Now, I, you know, you look at that and you think, well, okay, <laughs> if if billable hour firms are valued at one times gross revenue, if you if you take that, uh, then that makes them number 8 in <laughs> in the world. They're the eighth largest accounting firm in the country uh, on, under that valuation. Now, I don't happen to think the big four would be valued at one times gross. It would probably be more than that. But still, that tells you something mm. that uh, if, you, if you're building a business, you want to build a business like we were talking about with annual recurring revenue. So you don't start at zero every day. And that's also going to make the valuation much, much higher. That also has to be factored into all this because we just, you know, we tend to look at the profit of the moment. And we miss, by just looking at the math of the moment, we, we we miss the big picture of the valuation over the lifetime of the entity and the customer. Right. So when you, yeah, when you talk about the enterprise value of a business and the potential wealth event or exit event for the entrepreneur, for the business owner, right, doing a business with recurring revenue is going to gonna let you hit it out of the park way faster than doing a business where one-time sales is always occurring. And you hope hope to God that you can actually sell that business because who's going to want to buy that versus the versus the the business with enterprise value there. Um, right. So that makes that makes a lot a lot of sense. Um, are are there? You mentioned a couple of names of people that you know you follow, you read, um, that you're you're learning from. Who are some of those names of, of leaders in the space um, that have really been right probably writing about this for many years, but now are probably having a a renaissance of presence as thought leaders. Um, in the space, my go-to guy is Teen Zo, the founder of uh, Zora, and the author of the book Subscribed, which okay. we recommend highly on our radio show. And I think uh, I provided you and Andrea with a resources yeah. page that has links to all of this. But I'll just mention some of them. Are we did an episode with Teen Zo, and uh, you can find that on our archive page at thesoulofenterprise.com. He's got a weekly newsletter that you can subscribe to for free. And it's chocked full of, of interesting things, case studies that from around the world. It's mostly Zora customers. Sometimes it's not. Um, and he he stays on top of all of this, all of the mm -hmm. trends. And I, I've learned a ton from his work. And they put out special studies. You know, they have data scientists that kind of comb through their databases <laughs> and figure things out. And it's just really fascinating. Um, and, and again, this is all new. This is all 
different measurements. It's different vocabulary. It, it's all new. It's like learning a foreign language. I, I Again, I, I equate it to the Renaissance or the gold rush because it is. This is We're on the frontier here, um, and we're learning as we go, but it's exciting as all get out. Uh, another thought leader that we really like is Robbie Kilman Baxter. She wrote two books that we really like, The Membership Economy and uh, The Forever Transaction. It's a, it's a cute title. I don't like <laughs> it because it's got the word transaction, but I, you know that, that's her point. It's forever. Um, and, and then uh, we also interviewed her on the show, and there's links to that in the resources page. And then Ann Janzer, who's uh, a, an, another author, and she wrote Subscription Marketing, another book that we really like. And then John Warlow. Um, he's from Canada. He also wrote the book, the automatic customer. He also wrote built to sell. So mm. he's got a database on, um, what kind of multiples different businesses in different industries sell for. And he said, you know, when we look in the professional world space and we see a subscription business, we're seeing it sell at five, seven, eight times multiple wow. rather than just one Oh, you know, of gross. So, um, those are the, those are my four thought leaders. There are a few others, um, but those are the four big ones that I've learned the most from so far. That's great. Forever transaction sounds like a marriage book or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> like, it, yeah. It, it's actually a really, it's actually a really good book. She works with a lot of startups and she's out of Silicon Valley. So she's kind of, uh, in that world too. She's really, really bright. She, and you can follow her on LinkedIn too. She's always posting articles. She's, she's very thought provoking. That's great. Well, Ron, this has been a great conversation and, and thank you for sharing your knowledge and your insights and your passion for this. You can, you could see it bleeding out of you, which is, which is <laughs> awesome. I love it. How, if, if people want to learn more about you, about, um, kind of your writing, your, your, um, your writing, your resources, where do they go to find you? How do they get a hold of you? The best way is, is at the soul of enterprise.com. That's the weekly radio show. It is a live radio show, but then after it, it, plays live it drops down to podcasts on any podcast player so apple podcast stitcher you know spotify wherever you listen to your podcast i do that show with ed class we've done over 340 shows we're coming up on our seventh year and we have done um at least eight or nine shows just me and ed on subscription um whether it's talking about how this is going to work in the professional space whether it's comparing it to to value pricing all mm. of those issues we have also um, interviewed um, uh, lots of people that are using the subscription model in their business Two lawyers. And you'll see all this in the resources pages that I know you guys are going to post. But two lawyers use this model. Uh, uh, one CPA firm that we found, Jody Grunden from Summit CPA, uses the subscription model. He grew his practice from 600 grand, I believe, in 2004 to over $7 million today. And he did it. He credits all of that growth and profitability to the subscription model. He's got kind of a hybrid model, mm. um, but it's the closest thing we found. And then we've even interviewed a, doc, a direct primary care doctor, uh, Dr. Paul Thomas from Plum Health, which is outside of Detroit. Um, so he he serves like for like ninety nine dollars a month. So he's going after a lower lower middle class type uh, practice. This guy's thriving. He came right out of residency, started a DPC. He never did the traditional fee for service insurance model. He went right into DBC. And since we've been interviewing, we've done three interviews with him. He's opened another office. And I think he's got now four or five doctors working for wow. him. He's thriving. Wow. If That's he ever great. sells that practice, it's going to be, it's going to be a much higher valuation than if he was in a fee for service practice. And he's a thought leader in the space, helping a lot of other doctors make this transition. I've learned a lot from him too. That's great. That's great. Well, Ron, thank you so much. This has been a great conversation. Thank you again. And uh, if you like to learn more again, feel free to go to the soul of um, If you want to reach out to Ron Baker and listen to his information. If you want to learn more about Sazable, get Sazable.com. We're happy to help you with measuring recurring revenue metrics and 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 also uh, talk about more about what this conversation of subscription and, and recurring revenue. Thanks again, Ron. Thank you, Michael. It's been fun.